Welcome to the Next Gen Talk stage, Matthew Herdman. Go get him, Matthew. Have, have you ever experienced anxiety, w w worrisome thoughts, or felt obsessive? For as long as I can remember, I have fought with the voice in my head that tells me I won't succeed. According to the Stuttering Foundation, Stuttering is a communication disorder in which the flow of speech is broken up by re 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 repetitions, prolongations, or abnormal stoppages of sounds and syllables. I am one of roughly three million Americans who stutter, and I'm grateful for it. Today, I'm going to share with you my journey of stuttering and how it affected me as a child, a teenager, and now as an adult. What I believe it taught me about anxiety and worry, and share some of the tactics that I've taken to combat the after effects of reoccurring stuttering. I've stuttered for as long as I've been able to speak. It's something that's always been with me, just kind of taking up space. My dad, a fellow stutterer, didn't always have the best luck in school. He found his path scattered with kids who would torment and kids who would ridicule him all throughout the day. How did he respond? He got buff and decided to pick up football, because nothing says don't make fun of me like the ability to break somebody's wrist and then punt them across the cafeteria. <laughs> I've, never been, I've never really been one to get into a fight, so I prefer sports more along the lines of bobsledding and lawnmower racing, so football just wasn't really an option for me. So, as a child, my parents shielded me from the possibility of being uh, made fun of for my stutter the best way that they knew how, homeschooling. That's right, I stuttered and I was homeschooled. <laughs> I was that kid. In their minds, they believed sending me a flamboyant child who stuttered incessantly, often to the public school system, would be the equivalent of dipping me into a vat of Arby sauce and then dangling me over a lion's den. I can't say they were necessarily wrong, but I do believe isolation, like silence, isn't the most effective way to deal with a problem. Now, although I wasn't interacting with children daily, I was interacting with them quite frequently because we went to church on a regular basis. That's right, try to hold back how surprised you are homeschooled, and I went to church a lot. <laughs> now, although kids at church aren't quite as mean as kids at school, they can be just as ignorant. For instance, whenever I was eight years old, one of my best friends at the time was having a conversation with me. I'd gone to church with this boy for several years, and he and I were about as close as brothers. During our conversation, he asked me a question, I stuttered in my response, and he responded with one of the worst things that you can say to somebody who stutters. Just spit it out. I was shy, totally unsure of myself, and the last thing that I wanted to do was stutter more in response to what he said. So how did I respond? I did that nervous laugh thing <laughs> that you do whenever somebody says something mean, and then you don't really know what to say back. <laughs> and then we continued talking as if nothing was ever said. I chose silence and acted like his words didn't affect me, even though they did. An issue doesn't go away simply because you've bottled it up inside of you. Whether you don't know how to express what you're feeling, you're afraid of how people might respond, or maybe you're afraid of the mere act of expressing your opinion, avoidance of a situation only makes the situation worse. Flash forward a few weeks. Me, my friend, were playing outside one day at church. I start to stutter. You know what he says? Just spit it out. Well, now I had had time to process the event that had happened weeks prior. I was no longer the same eight-year-old as before. I had time to grow up, to change, to evolve. So what did I do? I respectfully told him that what he said negatively affected me, and it really hurt me, and I really liked him, and I really wanted him to be my friend, and I really didn't like it when he said things like that because it made me feel small and like I was being picked on. Just kidding, I spit on him. <laughs> And it wasn't like, like, even like a good spit where you gather up all that stuff in the back of your throat and you shoot it out like a llama at the zoo. This was more of a light sprinkle. <laughs> but I mean, I was this exuberant homeschool kid who stuttered incessantly and liked to watch The Price is Right with his grandma every morning. So it's not like you could really ask for much more. <laughs> Leading up to that moment where I did indeed just spit it out, I would regularly try to use words and all that would come out would be kink, 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 
regardless if I was trying to ask someone a question or tell someone a story or even just say, hi, 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 name is Matthew. I found myself frustrated, not just with me, but with the people around me who were unable to read my mind and know the thoughts and ideas that I was trying to get across. This frustration eventually formed into worry. Worry is something that we are all too familiar with in this day and age. Webster defines worry as giving way to anxiety or unease, allowing one's mind to dwell on difficulty or troubles. I like to think of worry like that one popcorn kernel that's just stuck in the back of your teeth. If that popcorn kernel was able to debilitate you and leave you breathless as you cried in your car in the gym parking lot. Okay, who here hated to read aloud in school? Anyone? Raise your hands. Anyone did not like to read aloud in school? Okay, awesome. Now imagine if it's time to read aloud in school. Now imagine if you have a stutter. Well, normally I would panic and then wait for a popsicle stick with my name on it to be drawn out of a cup as if I was about to head into the Hunger Games. I'd stutter as I awkwardly made my way through a few sentences. Thankfully, the teacher would eventually come to my rescue. We finally resolved to her sort of looking in my direction and non-verbally asking if I would like to read aloud, and I'd always look back with a... <laughs> and then we'd continue with the rest of the class reading. But that is not the scenario that we are imagining today. Today's scenario is that you have a substitute teacher, and instead of doing something boring like drawing names out of a cup, she wants to do something fun. Today we're going to start the reading on this side of the room, and one by one, the person who's supposed to read next will snake down until the very last reader has their opportunity to shine in front of the entire class. Can you guess who that last reader is? It's you. You spend the entire class obsessively saying to yourself, I'm going to stutter, 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 I'm going to stutter. It's time to read. What happens? You stutter, of course. Almost any time you have to read aloud, you spend the moments leading up to it worrying and obsessing about how something will go wrong. Is there the possibility of it going wrong even if you don't obsess? Absolutely. But will it go wrong if you consistently think about it going wrong? Absolutely. I can't remember the exact age, but leading up to me being a junior in high school, a large portion of my days were spent with me obsessively worrying that any time I was going to have to speak aloud, I wouldn't be able to. This worry eventually changed into a reoccurring nightmare that I would have. During my nightmare, I would be somewhere with someone who was really special to me. It could be my mom, my dad, my grandparents. It didn't matter, as long as this person was really special. For whatever reason, they would develop a life-threatening condition. They would insist that I call 911. Well, once I dial the phone and the operator answers with 911, what's your emergency? I'd freeze. I'd hold the receiver in my hand, look down at the person I loved, and all that would come out would be 911, what's your emergency? 911, what's your emergency? 911, what's your emergency? Obsessive thinking had worked itself so deep into my subconscious that my dreams were now an anxious rewiring of what I believed to be my greatest fear. Have you ever worried? Have you ever felt obsessive? Have you ever experienced anxiety? Have headlines or reporters or social media captions or, or news stations or politicians ever left you with a feeling of sorrow or dread that you can't shake? Has that anxiety, worry, or fear ever kept you from doing something? Now, raise your hand if you answered yes to any of the previous questions. Look around. You're not alone. Despite what that anxiety, worry, and fear tells you, it's nothing to be ashamed of. As I got older and started to make my way through high school, I noticed one day that my stutter just wasn't really a thing anymore. Now, don't get me wrong, it was still there, but much like your tattoo, you got that one drunken night in college, I just didn't think about it as much anymore. I found that because I wasn't thinking about it as much, I stuttered less and less. I did competitive speech and theater. I went on to get an associate's in theater and a bachelor's in musical theater. I worked for an established performing arts venue where I helped to create incredible pieces of content and fluently, verbally present with people in meetings. 
I spent several years of my life working as a clown, yes, an actual clown, where I traveled around the state of Oklahoma and did a 30-minute kids show centered around the benefits of dental health and juggled and did magic tricks and sang songs with a puppet. And being 100% serious, I sang songs with the puppet. And look at me now. I'm standing in front of all of you. I am cured. Wahoo! <laughs> what has my stutter taught me about anxiety, worry, and obsession? They're interesting creatures. They learn your every move. They never rest. They adapt. They have an incredible knack for spotting the weaknesses in your life that only you can see. When the object of your obsession doesn't stick anymore, does your obsession go away? Not really. As I've gotten older and find myself attempting to accomplish things as an adult, I see that my stutter has become less and less, but my obsession seems to have grown larger and larger. I rarely obsess about reading aloud, but I often obsess about the need to overwork myself so I don't get fired, which results in periods of incredible burnout. I rarely obsess about ordering at a restaurant, but I often obsess about how my friends only put up with me because they feel sorry for me, which results in me frequently isolating myself, thus perpetuating that feeling of aloneness. I rarely obsess about talking on the phone, but I often obsess about being an incredible disappointment to me, my family, and my loved ones, which results in me putting so much pressure on myself to accomplish my goals that some days I find the weight crippling. The hardest days are those ones where new obsessions are in play, but old ones decide to pop up anyway and snidely say when I'm introducing myself, you can't say your name. Don't waste everyone's time like that. But where does that leave me if I choose to walk in that reality of worry? It is really easy to say don't worry or don't obsess or don't be anxious, but it is a lot harder to actually not do those things. So over the last few months, I've been trying to incorporate some tactics into my life that have helped me in realizing that I'm not necessarily going to be able to eliminate the anxious thinking and worrying, but I can certainly have the clarity to see that these creatures don't have as much hold over my life as they'd like me to believe. One, breathing. <laughs> I find those days where I'm feeling really off-centered that if I can take a nice deep breath in and then a nice deep breath out, I'm in a much better headspace. So let's all try it together. What we're going to do is we're going to breathe in for five, using every single one of the five seconds to help your lungs to reach their full capacity. We're going to hold it, and then we're going to exhale. Ready? I find that if I do that five times in a row, I'm much better than I was before. Two, acknowledging your anxiety. So many times we have an anxious thought pop into our head, and what is the first thing that we do? We say, get out, you're not welcome here, I'm not feeling anxious today, I can't do this, I've got so many things that I've got to get done. But I found that if I sort of acknowledge that anxiety, be aware of how it makes me feel in this moment, and then say, I'm going to do my best to try and get back to work, the anxiety and the worry and the fear sort of gets tired and bored and then just walks away. Three, and last and most importantly, patience. You're going to have good days, and you're going to have bad days. And you're going to have really, really good days and really, really bad days. But what is important is that you are just as kind to yourself on those really bad days as you are on the really good ones. If I could go back in time and say anything to that boy who hated to read aloud or talk on the phone or wanted to change his name because the M sound was too hard for him to say, you know what I'd say when the voices in his head say, you're going to stutter. I say, so what? You've got this. You know what I'd say to that boy who, on the first day of school, he went up to his eighth grade history teacher to ask if he could use the restroom, but stuttered instead, so she thought that he was having a heart attack? I'd say, so what? You've got this. I'd also say, say that it's okay to laugh at this situation because in hindsight, it's pretty funny. <laughs> you know what I'd say to that person who's afraid to start that relationship, or the person who's afraid to open up their own business, or the person who's afraid to go back to school, or the person who's afraid to do anything at all because you can't stop thinking of reasons that it's going to fail? I would say that you might not succeed. But if you never allow yourself the freedom to fail, you could cut yourself off from something that could change your life in the most incredible and amazing way. You have got this, and even if you don't, so what? I've spent a lot of time in my life fighting a war that I thought was with a communication disorder. I now realize that it was one with myself. What war are you fighting today?
Thank you.